definitely think the sort of like world in which we're really neck and neck, you know, we only have a three month lead are incredibly dangerous, right? And we're in this like feverish struggle where like if they get ahead, they get to dominate. Maybe they get a decisive advantage. They're building clusters like crazy. They're they're willing to throw all caution to the wind. We have to keep up. There's some crazy new WMDs popping up. And then we're going to be in the situation where it's like, you know, crazy new military technology, crazy new WMDs, you know, like deterrence, mutually disturbed instruction, like keeps changing, you know, every few weeks. And it's like, you know, completely unstable, volatile situation. That is incredibly dangerous. So it's I think, I think, you know, both both from just the technologies are dangerous from the alignment point of view. You know, I think it might be really important during the intelligence explosion to have the sort of six month, uh, you know, wiggle room to be like, look, we're going to like dedicate more compute to alignment during this period because we have to get it right. We're feeling uneasy about how it's going. And um, so I think in some sense, like one of the most important inputs to whether we will kind of destroy ourselves or whether we will get through this just incredibly crazy period is whether we have that buffer, you know, a couple years of lead could be utterly decisive in say like military competition, right? You know, if you look at like Gulf War One, right? Gulf War One, you know, like the you know, Western coalition forces, you know, they had uh, you know, like a hundred to one kill ratio, right? And that was like they had better sensors on their tanks, you know, and they had they had better you know, more precision precision missiles, right? Like GPS, and they had um, you know, stealth, and they had sort of a few, you know, maybe 20, 30 years of technological lead, right? Um, and they, you know, just completely crushed them. Superintelligence applied to sort of broad fields of R and D, and then you know the sort of industrial explosion as well. You have the robots; you're just making lots of material. You know, I think that could compress. I mean, basically compress kind of like a century worth of technological progress into less than a decade. And that means that you know a couple years could mean a sort of Gulf War One style like you know advantage in in military affairs, um, and um, you know including like you know a decisive advantage that even like preempts nukes, right? Suppose like, you know, how do you find the stealth in nuclear submarines? Like right now, that's a problem of like, you have sensors, you have the software to like detect where they are. You know, you can do that, you can find them. You have kind of like millions or billions of like mosquito-like, you know, sized drones. And the, you know, they take out the nuclear submarines, they take out the mobile launchers, they take out the other nukes. And anyway, so I think enormously destabilizing, enormously important for national power. And at some point, I think people are gonna realize that. Not yet, but they will. And when they will, I think there will be sort of, you know, I don't think it'll just be the sort of AI researchers in charge. Um, and, uh, you know, I think on the, you know, the CCP is going to, you know, have sort of an all out effort to like infiltrate American AI labs, right? You know, like billions of dollars, thousands of pe people, you know, full force of the sort of, you know, Ministry of State Security. CCP is going to try to, you know, like outbuild us, right? Like they, you know, their, you know, power in China, you know, like the electric grid, you know, uh, they added a US as, you know, a complete, like they added as much power in the last decade as like sort of entire U.S. electric grid. So like the 100 gigawatt cluster, you know, at least the 100 gigawatts is going to be a lot easier for them to get. And so I think sort of, you know, by this point, I think it's going to be like an extremely intense sort of international competition. Unlike a nukes, the data centers are nukes. You have obviously the submarines, planes, you have uh, bunkers, mountains, whatever. You have them so many different places. A data center that your 100 gigawatt data center we can blow that shit up if you're like we're concerned right like just a, some cruise missile or something yeah. it is like very vulnerable to sabotage I mean, that, that gets to the sort of i mean that gets to the sort of insane vulnerability the volatility of this period post super intelligence right because basically i think so you have the intelligence explosion you have these like vastly superhuman things on your cluster but you're like you haven't done the industrial explosion yet you don't have your robots yet you haven't kind of you haven't covered the desert in like robot factories yet and that is the sort of crazy moment where you know Say, say the United States is ahead, the CCP is somewhat behind. There's actually an enormous incentive for a first strike, right? Because if they can take out your data center, they you know they know you're about to have just this command yep. decisive lead. They know if we can just take out this data center, right. you know, then we can stop it. And you know, they might get desperate. Basically, our generation, right? We're kind of so used to kind of, you know, basically peace and like, you know, the world, you know, American hegemony and nothing matters. Um but, you know, the sort of like extremely intense and these extraordinary things happening in the world um, and like intense international competition is like very much the historical norm. Like in some sense, it's like, um, you know, sort of uh, this, there's a sort of 20 year, very unique period. But like, you know, th the history of the world is like, you know, uh, you know, like in World War Two, right, it was like 50 percent of GDP went to, you know, like, you know, war production, production, you know, the U.S. borrowed over 60 percent of GDP, you know, and. In, in, you know, I think Germany and Japan over 100%. World War One you know, UK, Japan, sorry, UK, France, Germany all borrowed over 100% of GDP. Um, and, um, you know, I think the sort of 
much more was on the line, right? Like, you know, and, you know, people talk about World War I being so destructive and, you know, like 20 million Soviet soldiers dying and like 20% of Poland. But, you know, that was just the sort of like that happened all the time, right? You know, like seven years war, you know, like whatever, 20, 30% of Prussia died, you know, like 30 years war, you know, like uh, I think like, you know, up to 50% of like large swath of Germany died. Um, and, um, you know, I think the question is, will these sort of like, will people see that, the stakes here are really, really high. And that basically is sort of like history is actually back. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, I think the American national security state thinks very seriously about stuff like this. They think very seriously about competition with China. I think China very much thinks of itself on this as a historical mission and rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. They think a lot about national power. They think a lot about like the world order. And then, you know, I think there's a real question on timing, right? Like, do they do they start taking this seriously, right? Like, when the intelligence explosion is already happening, like, quite late? Or do they start taking this seriously, like, two years earlier? And that matters a lot for how things play out. But at some point, they will. And at some point, they will realize that this will be sort of utterly decisive um, for, you know, not just kind of like some proxy war somewhere, but, you know, like, whether liberal democracy can continue to thrive, whether, you know, whether the CCP will continue existing. Um and I think that will activate sort of forces that we haven't seen in a long time. Here's what I think we should do. I really don't want this volatile period. And so a deal with China would be nice. It's gonna be really tough if you're in this unstable equilibrium. I think basically we wanna get in a position where it is clear that the United States, that a sort of coalition of democratic allies will win. It is clear the United States would declare to China. You know, that will require having locked down the secrets. That will require having built the 100 gigawatt cluster in the United States and having done the natural gas and doing what's necessary. And then when it is clear that the Democratic coalition is well ahead, then you go to China and then you offer them a deal. And you know China will know they're going to win. This is going to be, they're very scared of what's going to happen. We're going to know we're going to win, but we're also very scared of what's going to happen because we really want to avoid this kind of like breakneck, breakneck race right at the end um, and where things could really go awry. And... You know, and then and then, so then we offer them a deal. I think there's an incentive to come to the table. I think there's a sort of more stable arrangement you can do. It's a sort of an atoms for peace arrangement. And we're like, look, we're going to respect you. We're not we're not going to like we're not going to use super intelligence against you. You can do what you want. You're going to get your like you're going to get your slice of the galaxy. Um, we're going to like we're going to benefit share with you. We're going to have some like compute agreement where it's like there's some ratio of compute that you're allowed to have. And that's like enforced with their like opposing AIs or whatever. And um and we're just not going to do, we're just not going to do this kind of like volatile sort of WMD arms race to the death.